Good morning, Sonia. Hi, great to see Hi. you. Good morning, Kinga. How are you? <laughs> Good. This is Sonia Fernandez from Kibo Ventures in Spain. It's uh, great to have you with us here today. Um, Sonia, you know, as a, as a first question, you're a partner with Kibo. Could you tell us a little bit about how you got there, about your background and about your role uh, right now and what you're doing? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So I came to, to the investment world uh, from having done many things before. And I think that's something that is, is interesting because uh, you can bring more to founders when you have had a past, I think. Uh, so that's, that's a value add. I uh, studied uh, my undergrad in uh, Spain and, and in the UK. Uh, business and after uh, graduation I went to work in investment banking in London and New York. Um, I was an analyst doing m and work and after that uh, I went to uh, do an MBA at Stanford in, in California and that really changed a little bit, well a lot, <laughs> my perspective on, this was a long time ago, 99, um, so there was a lot going on in, in the Bay Area and a lot of tech companies were being started, eBay was started at Google at the time, so um, I knew I wanted to do something uh, related to technology, um, so when my classmates of mine we're starting a company called Mercado Libre, which ended up being a very successful company based in Latin America. It's, it was following the eBay model. Uh, they wanted to launch in, in Spain and they needed somebody to start that business in Spain. So I said, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I'll, I'll join you guys. So after the Mercado Libre experience, that I knew that, you know, the finance time for me was over. I wanted to, to you know, continue to do work with technology companies. And uh, I've done different things from e-commerce to, uh, I spent almost seven years running Match.com, the online dating site in Spain, Latin America and Italy. And, and so a lot of work with uh, uh, platforms, uh, online marketing, direct to consumer related uh, topics. And after that experience, I spent quite a bit of time doing ad tech. So, uh, oh. I worked for an American company that was doing things uh, in terms of behavioral targeting, very innovative uh, technology at the time re related to advertising. Um, and then at some point in my life, I also took a little bit of a break for personal reasons. And that was a, a time for us, for me to think, you know, what should I be doing next? And um, I knew the Kibo Ventures, two founders that had started the fund in 2012. I knew them from previous lives. One of the founders, we had worked together in investment banking in London, and the other founder was also had done a similar business to my Mercado Libre days. And they had launched Kibo in 2012, and they were raising and that was around the time that I was thinking, uh, about doing something different and our paths crossed. I think uh, they wanted to raise a bigger fund. They, they were in need for another partner to come on board. And, um, and obviously I thought I could really bring a lot of the operational uh, and, and experience working you know, with tech companies to the fund and bring in that perspective as we you know, engage with uh, entrepreneurs. So that's a little bit of my story coming from a finance to a technology background to then you know, just becoming an investor through, you know, knowing the, the founders of, uh, of Kibo Ventures. I think it's a, it's a great path because you've seen a couple of companies grow while you were the operational person behind them as the head of the country. Um, mm -hmm. So it's like setting up a startup very close to what founders are experiencing. And I think on the operational side, this is super useful to have someone who really understands how to do it. So I'm sure that the founders you're working with can really greatly benefit from your experiences with Match and with Mercado Libre, yes? Yeah, I think um, it's also, you, you definitely feel, uh, and with Mercado Libre, it's been you know, quite a while back, but uh, you know, you know what, it, what it's like to start something from zero to the struggle, the, the 24 seven, your mind, everything you do is based on how can we make this work? So I can definitely empathize very much with the uh, with the founders, but it's also, you know, Mercado Libre was a success story, but equally it could have been not so successful. So, and you know, sometimes 
you know, the idea that starting a company, everything's going to go well, because obviously that, that's not the case. And I think we need to have founders that have the enough stamina and will and willpower and resilience, resilience to understand, look, it's going to be very tough. So you really need to be up for it and, and really understand why they want to do it. You know, is it because, you know, they want to start a, a business and have that as part of their experience? Does, does the fact that they're starting a company or running a company come from a deeper sense of this is something that I really need to do because I'm solving a problem. I see that this is not working and I want to fix it. And those are the founders that will be able to overcome the difficult times. And those are the founders that I think are stronger to be able to, to, to be, you know, just more resilient as you were saying. Uh, so having lived that experience of this is incredibly hard, you have to make a lot of tough decisions, fire people uh, that you were friends with, you know, like sometimes really things that are, are very tough to do that you wouldn't be doing it at a corporate level, maybe not, not in such intensity. Um, I think it's, uh, it's good to bring that on the table. And also, I think the fact that I was able to work for companies that were able to scale to a level that were very big, I think that, that that's also good learning because the skill sets that you need to start a business are different from the skill sets that you will need to develop, develop to really grow it. And some managers are very good at starting things and they're terrible at managing scale-ups because they feel you know they're no longer in control of everything or they have to delegate too much or they feel if they were doing it they would do it better than anyone else coming on board so I think it's uh it's also very relevant to to find the right manager give them the coaching that if they don't have it that they need to be able to look you know it, this is only going to be big as the way as you want it to be if you're able to get great talent to work with you and sometimes you know, it's not, it's not that easy, uh, but they need to really grasp that because otherwise, you know, we see great companies that don't really make it because, uh, you know, they haven't been able to attract the right talent. Uh, so that's, that's also a nice learning that we can bring into the table. All these tough times bring sort of the pandemic into view, right? And the, the kind of things that are going on, which is another new challenge for today's founders, how to handle it. Uh, maybe uh, it's a good time to ask, what are you currently thinking about and working on in the new normal? Um, what are the kind of projects uh, that you think uh, are interesting and can sustain this additional stressful time and, and be successful over the longer time frame? Yeah, no, it's very interesting. We just, <clears throat> uh, just one second on, on, on Kibo uh, for our fund. So we are um, a fund based in... In Spain, we have offices in Madrid, Barcelona, and, and, and Lisbon, and we invest in, in typical Series A uh, rounds. So initial tickets between one to three million, we can put up to 10 million in a company. So we do follow on rounds. Uh, I want to take the company to, to the next level and grow with them. Um, we invest primarily in European companies. Uh, oftentimes, we have invested in companies that are based in the US, but have their tech hub in Madrid or Barcelona, and, and that's a good uh, mm -hmm. way for us to get engaged with the company. So that's a little bit where we invest in terms of stage. And we invest across different sectors. Uh, we have now done the, fir the first closing of our third fund. Uh, in our first funds, we had more of a mix of a B2B, B2C portfolio. Fund two has been more geared towards B2B companies, although we've done some consumer. And just to answer your question, in terms of what we've seen, uh, in terms of deal flow, uh, we're very optimistic. Um, we believe Fund2 has better companies overall, if I can say that oh, they're all our companies, we think they're all great, but versus Fund1, just because the, the ecosystem is more mature and, and that applies to, to our time today. We're seeing founders that are oftentimes uh, second time founders they've done another startup before, they were able to sell it successfully, but now they want to do something much bigger. They, and they understand the rules of the game. We're seeing that increasingly more. We're seeing a lot of activity around FinTech, a lot of great startups and future of work is very, uh, as a category is really, and that touches FinTech, it touches HR tech, 
um, you know, software and communication tools, but that we see it as a very interesting space coming probably accelerated by the pandemic as well. Um, health tech, obviously a uh, uh, big search of companies that are using data uh, mm -hmm. to make all the processes in hospitals uh, more efficient. And that's very relevant for today. Uh, education tech companies that are also um, trying to figure out how to best engage uh, kids while they have to do remote learning or semi-remote learning. Mm -hmm. So those are categories that are definitely very much impacted by, by COVID. Uh, and in general, I think the challenge with the founders and the entrepreneurs that we have, and even our portfolio companies is, how do they keep the culture going while you know they're not they're both everyone or most of the people are working remotely but they still need to be able to to get people engaged glued together and and some of them are really coming up with very creative ways of uh, doing it you know like having the stand up is maybe online but everyone needs to you know become more personal and tell more about you know what's going on in their lives so um to you know meet after work but do it in a digital fashion uh some of them have decided that they do want to come back and work in the office uh so it's a mix but that i think that's going to be a, a challenge how can they get you know people will be at their homes doing coding or doing their thing and and they'll be able to hit their KPIs. And but how do they keep it all together? How do how, the sense of belonging that gets really, you know, that happens when people are in the office and you know sharing? How can that be replicated when they're not in the same physical space? I think that's a you know some some challenge for you know startups today. Yeah, it's a huge challenge when you're building on a corporate culture that you firmly believe in. How yeah. do you create that? And then how do you encourage the new people that you're hiring to come into that culture? You just don't know if you've never actually even met them uh, as that could be the case, right? Uh, I mean, in a way it's an opportunity to hire people globally yes. and um, build remote teams. But that has the, the other, the flip side of that is that building a corporate culture is much harder in that scenario. Yeah, absolutely. And, and for us, to be honest, because we just um, we just did the first closing of our fund three, we haven't been... Congratulations. Really... It's <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And you did it during the pandemic, right? Yes, during the pandemic, uh, but we haven't yet invested during the pandemic because we were mm -hmm. in between funds. Uh, so we, we're not one of the funds that has invested fully without ever doing a face-to-face -face with the founder. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure we... we we will do it if we have to. I mean, now we're we're evaluating deal flow, and we haven't yet seen uh, the founders, and uh, it's a bit more of a challenge because we always feel we need to feel that we have that connection to the founder because we're in mm -hmm. in this for the long run. But you know, I think we're you know, like you know, even via Zoom, that we can have a very good connection. So I think that. It's not going to stop investors from investing, and and to be honest, most of the the, the funds that and, and probably you probably have invested already in, in in companies during the pandemic, you know that will go on. I think getting people to come in, onboarding new hires for mm. the startups that are growing so much, I think that's a little bit of the challenge. That you know you're sitting at home, you have all the Zoom meetings and and all the you know Slack, and you're super well connected, but um yeah that's that's going to be interesting and look it there are companies that do fully remote and it works well but uh but yeah uh, we always believe uh you know if there's there's something that is going to be missing from from you know the founders being able to really convey that culture to the team that glues it all together yeah definitely but just to come back, you've um, you've raised your third fund. You've done the first close. You're looking at Series A. Um, to what extent do the projects need to be um, with a link to Spain or the Iberic Peninsula? They don't have to. I mean, we okay. we market ourselves as um, we invest primarily in Europe because you know we naturally we will see more deal flow coming from. Mm -hmm. Spain, Portugal, but equally, I mean, we have out of our fund too, a third of our companies are not in Spain. So okay. we, we believe that, 
And increasingly, as we uh, develop our portfolio network and, and also our network of uh, um, other VC firms, sometimes you know we're asked to to come in a, in a syndicate for investment, and you know that company is not in Spain, but maybe there's a link to Spain if they mm -hmm. think Spain might be an interesting market for them to launch, and that could be the reason why we we are invited. But equally, I mean we. We're invited to demo days of funds. Uh, we have good relationships with some funds in the US and we attend those demo days. It is, it's not the easiest thing to come in to and you know, do deals with the US from Spain. We, we don't have that thinking that that's gonna happen, but more times than you would think, there are companies that are based, maybe are doing a financial product in Latin America that could also come to Europe and, and they see us as a fund with good connections in both sides. Or, you know, we have Telefonica, big telco companies, one of our LPs. Sometimes we we come, uh, we get connected to interesting companies. One of our investments is a, a company that is close to the telco world that is based in Canada, just because that Telefonica angle made it natural for us to evaluate the company. So, yeah, we, we don't see ourselves as... Um, necessarily concentrated in the markets where we have our offices. Mm -hmm. um, but equally, you know, we'll do a, you know, a big percentage probably of still deals mm -hmm. coming from this part of the world. Okay, okay. And how is it best to approach you? Well, uh, you can uh, visit our website. You can contact me at sonia at Uh We evaluate everything. We look at everything that comes in. We have like the general email. Uh, we have a deal flow, um, like inbound meeting that we have every every week to, to look at the things that mm -hmm. have come. And to be honest, sometimes if founders knock on our doors, cold calling, so to speak, sometimes it's it's more difficult to come in just because, you know, you have to do a lot of filtering, you know. But if if it's the right stage of investment and, it, and if it's uh, at one of the sectors that we're interested in, uh, we will definitely look at the project. Uh, uh, my advice to founders is do your due diligence on the fund because probably through your network, through the founders network, they're able to either know another founder or another investor that may know us. And mm -hmm. it is always uh, nicer to break, you know, to. to to break through the uh, noise if, if we can get a, a direct recommendation from somebody else. Um, but we're very open to, I mean, we have a relatively big team uh, and um, you know, it's, it's our job is to invest, but also to look at projects to invest. Mm -hmm. We need to do a lot of, you know, analyzing projects and we also need to be on the lookout. So we we're always very active going to you know, demo days of other funds uh, and trying to see what's out there because uh, oftentimes maybe it's not a company that we would invest in, but it's maybe a good company that we can connect one of our portfolio companies to that company, or it's a company that interests us because it can help us validate a business model that another company that we may be looking at is, is mm -hmm. trying to do. So it's always... You know, that's what we like to do also, uh, you know, understand what companies are doing and, and, and see entrepreneurs. So, yeah, we, you can always come talk to us, basically. OK, brilliant. Uh, this means that startups really from all over Europe can uh, can approach you easily. This is really good news, especially I guess it's super valuable for the ones that want to expand in your region. Um, yeah, yeah absolutely. highly recommended. Absolutely. And look, I think sometimes my recommendation to to founders is, you need to knock on a lot of doors and you just never know, you know, we may have some knowledge of your business because we've done a similar investment in the field mm -hmm. or one of our partners might be, you know, super knowledgeable on a certain area. And if you do your, your diligence well, you may find that angle. You may find, well, you know, this person worked with somebody or, you know, this person has a PhD in this area. And we always like to think that, um, this is not a size fits all type of, you know, yes, money is money, but I think it's very important to, to, to have a good fit at the end of the day. So there's a reason why, you know, uh, founders come to us, but, but equally, you know, we, we also need to be, to feel comfortable uh, with the founders that it's, it's a mutual 
uh, matching, I think, at the end of the day. So I think the more research the founders do on, on, on mm -hmm. the investors, the better. And, and nowadays, you know, through all the social media and LinkedIn, it's probably relatively easy to find somebody in your network that knows somebody within our portfolio companies. And we always say, look, it's important to talk to us, but it's more important to talk to the to the companies that we have invested in because they will be able to tell you, you know, are these guys engaged? Mm -hmm. Do they add value at the board level? Do they ask for unreasonable things? Uh, do they pick up your phone? Uh, you know, are they are they really, you know, are they people that are easy to talk to? And and you will get that information from, from the portfolio. We've invested in 53 companies across all of our history since 2012. So Wow, you know, not not all the companies have been successful. We've 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 had write-offs, and and that's also sometimes very good to talk to those <laughs> founders because there's always learnings that comes from from the companies that didn't make it. And but know. actually, Sonia, you're leading me to the question about your exits because you've done some really spectacular uh, exits to really spectacular names, and uh, it's it's very impressive. You know, as, as venture investors, we're always thinking about really the exit scenario and where that's going to take us. Yeah. Um, and you really have a track record of that. Could you just say a few words on exits? Yes, we, we believe that obviously we're here to invest, but we're here to also exit and, and give the money back to our LPs. So, so we need to understand how that's going to happen. I think one of the things that, that founders should try and understand is how helpful is the, the VC going to be and in helping the founder through their exit strategy. Obviously, when you're raising a series A round, exit is not the thing that you're thinking about. You know, you, mm -hmm. you still have a long way to go, but time goes by. And then we do a lot of work talking to corporates, uh, talking talking to uh, obviously other investors that will be able to, to you know, do lead the, the follow on rounds, that's for sure. But in terms of exits, you know, talk to the the leading U.S. Uh, you know big corporates. We have connections and and try to foster them because uh, these companies are, as well they're looking for interesting uh, companies that are in the market. And and an exit is not going to happen if you're not visible. If you haven't, if you if you think you you know maybe you will be acquired by. Oracle or Salesforce or I don't know a, a corporation. You've never really approached them. That exit's not going to happen. You need to to engage with them uh, mm -hmm. and 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 make yourself seen. And sometimes it's easier to do that if you know us as a fund. We have a conversation with the corporate uh, VC arms of these big companies that are on the lookout for good technology, and then we can showcase some of the good companies that are we think are more ready. Uh, at the end of the day, it's always the best exits are the ones where you don't have to look for them. You know, the buyer comes and, and wants you. But uh, but at the same time, I think even in those cases, they need to be used. And that's a challenge for some of the European startups that uh, they need to get out of the shell and they need to show that they have good technology. Uh, and oftentimes, you know, the valuations are more competitive than you know you can get more for your money with uh with a european company that has has not raised such a big amount of money that the exit becomes just too pricey so uh and you have access to great talent great engineers uh we've seen it all the time how u.s companies are amazed by the amount of work and 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 product development that engineers in our markets have been able to do compared to what they see in other markets. And I'm sure you see that in your part of the world as well. So that's something that I need to, we need to be more conscious. We have assets that are valuable and, and as a fund, we need to make sure that we give our portfolio companies the opportunity to, to you know, just be out there more. That's a big takeaway from this conversation is make sure that the investor you get on board has and is nurturing those relationships with Absolutely. much larger strategic players, with the whole ecosystem of exits. And it's something that uh, is really, really valuable for a startup founder. So I think we should make a big point of this, that Kibo is really working on this, you know, for many years now and has this experience. So well done on that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's that's another part of the due diligence that founders can can do. You know, 
uh, who have you been able to sell your companies to? And sometimes, you know, we have nice names like PayPal or Groupon or Airbnb, but equally, you know, in the, in the tech ecosystem, uh, you know, you need to understand, you know, how well connected the partners of the fund are, what type of things are they doing to try to, to foster those relationships? Because uh, sometimes the role of the fund is not critical. You know, sometimes the sale just happens, mm -hmm. but sometimes, you know, we can, re we can, we can help and we can make, uh, you know, we can um, showcase those portfolio companies much more. And, and that's something that we feel is part of our job to do as well. Super valuable. Uh, thanks a lot, Sonia. I wanted to ask you a final question, something about you. Maybe there's something that you've come up recently that you've been reading or watching that you can recommend as a final note. Ah, wow. Uh, one of the things just uh, on a personal note that I I really take a lot of value and I really enjoy, I'm, I, I'm I belong to a book club of women uh, from all different backgrounds. So we, we meet once a month a month, uh, and, uh, you know, discuss a book. And we, we read about different things and uh, different topics. Um, and I don't know, the last book I read was a novel by Hilary Mantle. It's called The Mirror and the Light. And it's about Henry VIII and, and how... Uh, Thomas Cromwell died and, and all of that historical moment so it was pretty interesting so sometimes I think also you know you need to get away from all the business related <laughs> and I, I try to you know in my uh, try to put a little bit of a something not related to to digital and 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 tech because I think that gives me some breather in my head and I think it's healthy as well so that's another maybe thing to think to think about <laughs> it's also good advice for founders i think yeah just you know go out watch uh you know some netflix thing that it doesn't relate to technology or something that is too deep into business model and optimization and just you know get something more creative going in your head <laughs> absolutely absolutely great thanks a lot sonia it was great to have you here sonia fernandez from kibo ventures in spain Thank you so much for your time and looking forward to working together. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye. Bye. <laughs>